Well, good evening to everyone, and welcome to you tonight. Uh, we're not uh, as many tonight, although I think some folks were at the funeral this afternoon and maybe uh, not able to return. And indeed, there have been a number of, of, of bereavements, uh, as you perhaps um, know. Uh, we buried John Johnson uh, this afternoon. Um, and also, uh, we remember in our prayers, um, there's um, Richmond's um, sister Iris, um, passed away. Her funeral is in Port Dunone uh, Presbyterian Church uh, tomorrow, I think it is. And uh, then also this morning, uh, you'll be um, sad to hear that Edith Waterman passed away. She hadn't been well for, uh, well, a number of weeks now, really. She, as you know, had um, dementia for the last number of years and had been in Nandina nurse, uh, residential home and was very well cared for there for I don't know, four or five years, six years maybe, uh, sometime. And then when she became in need of nursing care, they weren't able to keep her there, and they moved her to Slemish, and we thought perhaps she would only be there for a few days. Um, and um, she hung on, and her pulse was strong. And, and then they opened a new uh, wing there with some lovely new um, rooms, at the, a new section to Slemish, and uh, she moved in there a few weeks ago and uh, passed away. Um, gently this morning. So her funeral will take place here in the church on Wednesday at 12, at 12 o'clock. Uh, so Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that needs um, a, announced other than a, just a, a reminder that uh, next Sunday is our harvest and uh, Philip Gallagher in the morning and then uh, the Reverend Roy Cooper uh, who a number of years ago, I, mean, I don't know how long ago since Roy was the minister in Ballymena. Um, he's retired uh, a while now and lives in Newton Ards and a former president. Uh, so uh, Roy will be the preacher at the uh, evening uh, service. And then on the Monday, um, I will, well, I was going to say be the preacher, but it'll be a short epilogue and a, a praise service, uh, leaving lots of time to enjoy wee buns and, and, and supper and a bit of chat and crack. So... Uh, that's the harvest weekend uh, uh, next next weekend. So let's worship God as we um, sing, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, forgive our foolish ways.
I did uh, mean to include in the announcement just a reminder that obviously next Sunday evening our friends from the Cunningham will uh, join us. They won't have an evening service and encourage uh, the Presbyterians um, to come. And then the following week will be their harvest, so we won't have an evening service here uh, that uh, Sunday evening and encourage you to go to their harvest. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this lovely familiar hymn that blesses us every time uh, we sing it. And it is a, a prayer, and it's the prayer of our hearts this evening, Lord, that you would drop your still dews of quietness till all our striving cease and take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of your peace. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we are too busy. Uh, we are rushing around uh, with our work, uh, with our family, uh, with our hobbies, sometimes even rushing around doing church work, uh, doing uh, things in your service, uh, good things, and yet perhaps sometimes they distract us and they keep us from focusing upon you. And so, Lord, it is good for us to come of a Sunday evening and just sit in your presence and listen for your voice and enjoy fellowship with one another and we ask, O oh God, that you will bless each one of these lovely, faithful folks who come to worship this evening. Lord, may there be a blessing from your word, uh, something that we sing, something that we pray, even just a quiet thought, uh, a prompting from your Holy Spirit, that still, small voice of calm that would speak to us and reassure us and comfort us, and guide and direct us, and that in all the business of whatever this week ahead may bring, and whatever the week past has troubled us with, that we would be re-centered upon you and focused upon your love and grace, and know that you are the sovereign Lord, and you are in control. So Lord, do forgive us for our foolish ways and for being distracted, and not focusing upon you. And Lord, may this time uh, be a rich blessing for each one of us. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our uh, reading then is uh, from uh, the book of 1 Peter, and uh, Dennis uh, is our um, reader um, this evening. And when you see Dennis hobbling up on his bad knee, you remember to say a prayer for him as he goes for his surgery in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, it'll take him a few weeks to get back on his feet again. But the next time, next time you see Dennis coming up to read, he'll be sprinting. Like. <laughs> this evening's reading is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. It's to be found on the Church Bible at page 1220. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged recording according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in his various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Dennis. And in our prayers now for uh, others, we'll spend just a, a few moments uh, to pray for um, folks who have been bereaved, uh, some I mentioned um, earlier, others maybe uh, who you might uh, uh, know of and call to, to mind, and uh, pray God's continuing comfort and strength uh, for them. Uh, leave a little time of quietness too when you might care to bring to God people you know who um, are in need of our prayers some who've been through surgeries, uh, some, um, like Dennis, going for surgery, all being well uh, in the near future. There are other folks also that you may or may not know about who are going through various tests and so on from our congregation uh, to pray God's um, good outcome for those um, things. And then I'll take up a couple of themes from the prayer focus and to pray for the Bangor and Hollywood circuits, the European Methodist Council, and the Methodist Church in Zimbabwe and the Castlewell on Holiday Week. Uh, and there are still um, some copies of this in the foyer. We didn't get sent as many this year as um, we have, I think, in previous years, but there are still um, a few paper copies uh, left. You can take one. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of praying together as a church family and we will uh, think a little bit later of um, Peter's um, teaching that Dennis read for us, that we uh, should love one another earnestly. And part of that is that we, uh, we pray for each other to support and encourage each other. And so, Lord, we remember those uh, in our congregation and in our circle of family and friends and acquaintances who have been bereaved in recent weeks or months. And we pray, uh, Lord, for um, John Johnson's family and for his close friends, uh, people um, like um, Sam and Mooring, uh, who have been such good friends and support uh, to John through his illness. Uh, but we pray for his brother, for his nephews and nieces, and all those who gathered here for that service this afternoon. And we pray that you will comfort them and keep them. Uh, we pray, Lord, for the Richmond family circle uh, after Aris's um, passing. We pray uh, for her family and for the, uh, uh, the Connachty family. And we pray for the, the service, uh, I think it's tomorrow, uh, in the Presbyterian Church in Port Glenone, that uh, you will bless them as they gather uh, to give thanks for Iris's long life and, uh, and for her battles uh, with illness in recent times. And uh, we ask your comfort and strength for them. Uh, we pray, Lord, for Desmond. We thank you that he is one who's been through surgery, and we trust that it has gone well. We know it will take a little time for things to heal up and to just see how good a result he gets. But we pray that it will be as good as it can be and that you'll continue to grant your healing to him and that you will bless uh, all that family circle in the days ahead. We thank you, Lord, for Edith Waterman and uh, we thank you, Lord, for her years of quiet, gentle service here uh, in this church. Uh, supporting her husband, we know that Ronald was uh, uh, brought up in this church and, and, and contributed so much in many different ways uh, to the life of this church uh, until his passing some nearly 30 years ago now. Um, and all uh, those years that uh, Edith has lived as a, as a widow, we, we thank you, Lord, that you have been with her. And... Um, we thank you, Lord, for her, her family circle. It's not very big. We know that she lost a daughter uh, to cancer, and her nieces uh, are really the only uh, family left. And uh, perhaps there won't be very many of us that will be able to gather here for her funeral service on Wednesday. 
But Lord, we pray that those who gather here will, with sincere hearts, be able to worship you with thankfulness for Edith's life, a long life, uh, and a life of gentle, quiet, loving service. So Lord, comfort that family circle who mourn, and others too. Uh, there'll be others, Lord, known to us. And just in this quiet moment, we think of them, and we think of others too, uh, who are uh, struggling with their um, health. Uh, thank you that some are making good progress. Thank you for the prospect of tests and examinations for others. We trust that the results will come back uh, with good results and, if need be, uh, diagnose something that does need to be treated and that uh, the doctors, surgeons, and others will be able to do the best they can. And for those, Lord, who are just getting frail and um, uh, infirm, uh, some who are confused, uh, some, Lord, uh, who face just a battle ahead. We, we in this quiet moment, uh, bring them to you in our prayers. And our Father, we pray, too, for our Methodist Church. We pray for the Circuit of Bangor and Hollywood and for the ministers there, for Philip Corrigan and Sharon Connor, uh, for those who help as pastoral assistants or youth workers, for uh, Denise Wilson and Colin Burrows, and for the student uh, minister who's there on placement, uh, Colin Houston. We pray, Lord, that they'll work well together as a team on that circuit, supporting and encouraging each other, and uh, that you will bless them. We pray, Lord, for the European Methodist Council, uh, and for those who are involved in it. And we pray for uh, those from Ireland who are part of that, Heather Morris and Jeremy Nicholl and Catherine Hart. And as they coordinate various aspects of work um, in the Methodist Church, Methodist churches uh, throughout uh, Europe, uh, that you will bless them. We pray for the Methodist Church in Zimbabwe. And we thank you, Lord, for the links that we have with a, a number of folks who have come uh, from Zimbabwe uh, to us and the Reverend uh, Twanda Sungai, uh, who has been uh, working uh, here in Ireland uh, for a, a couple of years now. Thank you for the links that are built that Lawrence Graham has developed uh, with the Methodist Church in uh, Zimbabwe to strengthen uh, relationships uh, between our churches. And we pray for uh, the church in Zimbabwe. We know, Lord, that uh, that country in re recent years, recent decades indeed, has had a difficult history, and there have been those uh, in political power who have become dictators. Uh, others have uh, attempted to bring about um, democratic change and have had a little success perhaps at times, but then even they sometimes uh, succumb to the, to the temptations uh, of, uh, and the trappings of, of, of power. And so we pray uh, for the people of Zimbabwe and for the Methodist leaders and church leaders uh, in that nation, uh, that, Lord, they will see greater levels of a good governance enabling uh, a country that ought to be a wealthy country, that one time years back uh, was regarded as the breadbasket of southern Africa uh, with fertile ground and, 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 and many uh, crops grown, and, and, and yet now there are many people who are hungry and dependent upon food aid. And so we pray that there will be improvements uh, in that nation. And then, Lord, for the Castlewell and Holiday Week, we thank you for some of the folks from our own church who have been involved in that over many years. And perhaps some of us, uh, years gone past, we were involved. Uh, but for those who are uh, involved now and for the committee, that's just over for the year, obviously, now, and, and the committee will be planning for next year. And so guide them and direct them, we pray that it might be a continued source of encouragement, particularly to young people and young families uh, who have benefited much over uh, the years that, uh, that Castlewell and Holiday Week has run, particularly for our, our Methodist uh, people. And finally, Lord, we think of some situations around the world where there is dreadful conflict. And sometimes we scarcely know how to pray or what to pray for situations in the Middle East, and the war, the conflict uh, with, uh, to the north, uh, with Hezbollah, uh, to the west with, um, uh, with Hamas, uh, to the um, east with Iran, to the south with the Houthis, uh, 
Um, and all around uh, little Israel, there are those nations that seek its destruction. Um, Lord, we pray that uh, you will strengthen those who work for peace and those who, who respect Israel's right to exist. We thank you, Lord, that uh, Israel is still a nation that you have a special place for, uh, a people that you chose through whom the Messiah came. And though they did uh, reject him, we thank you, Lord, for the prophecies that seem to speak to us of, of a time when they will recognize Jesus and return. Uh, so, Lord, we pray uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, we pray for that um, situation, for all those who are suffering around it, uh, for all kinds of uh, difficult uh, reasons. And then, Lord, we, we, we pray finally that you, will, um, that you will bless us in this week ahead. Um, we pray, Father, that we will have opportunity somewhere uh, along the line in this uh, week uh, to be a blessing uh, to some who are, who are lost, that we'll have the opportunity to witness uh, to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and witness to some who are lost. We pray, too, that we will have the opportunity to be a blessing to the saints, uh, to encourage and build each other up and love one another, and all of this in anticipation of Christ's return, knowing that perhaps even this week the Lord might return and help us, Lord, to live in the light of that sense of time and eternity. So hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now we bring our offering to God for his work. And uh, we'll sing together again. Uh, we'll sing this old hymn, Jesus Calls Us O'er the Tumult of Our Life's Wild Restlessy. Uh, Rebecca was just checking the tune uh, with Billy. Uh, so just follow what Billy's singing.
Now, this evening, I'm just going to have a little dip into this section that Dennis read for us, 1 Peter uh, chapter uh, 4. And I'm going to uh, just skip through it fairly um, quickly. Um, first of all, because I'm running out of steam. Uh, a funeral in the afternoon always tires me out a bit. Uh, and then I've got the Youth Fellowship as well tonight, so I should have prayed for them earlier on. But uh, um, Philip said to me, I said, I'm, I said to Philip, are you coming? He said, yeah, but I might fall asleep. Um, so I, uh, that, 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 oh, that was Sam said that, was it? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, accusing the wrong brother. I, I might fall asleep first, so. <laughs> Warren Wearsby has a nice little outline for this, which I'm going to borrow. And uh, he has a, a, a title for the section called um, The Rest of Your Time. And it's interesting that uh, the word time appears twice in the first few verses of our, of our reading, uh, though the NIV doesn't always uh, use the word so um, uh, the NIV likes to, likes to change what the words are sometimes just to make it flow a bit more easily in English, which is fair enough. And uh, if you're reading it uh, in a way that, that it flows nicely, that, that's a good principle in, in Bible translation. Um, though if Peter decided that he needed to use the same word six times, and then another word for the seventh time. There are seven times when the word time appears in, in, in this. I, I'll, just, I'll just run through them very quickly uh, for you. You get a sense of it. In chapter 1, verse 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Uh, verse 11, trying to find out the time and circumstances in which the Spirit of Christ came. Uh, it came, um, the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing to the, predicting, to the predicted sufferings of Christ. Uh, verse 17, and if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And then into chapter 4, we've got these couple uh, that we've read already. Uh, so live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer uh, for human passions, but for the will of God. And verse uh, 3, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles used to do. And verse 17, which we didn't read that far, uh, the time for judgment begins with the household of God. And all of those are the same word in Greek, uh, uh, the word chronos, from which we would get our word chronological, you know, chronology of time. Uh, the last one, which is in chapter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Uh, that's the word kairos, which is a different uh, word. And it has this notion of uh, a crucial time, a, a changing time, a time of, 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 of something new, um, pointing to that time when all of these times that uh, have come so far, and then there will come a time uh, that will be a new time uh, when Christ will uh, re return. So in the meantime, pun intended, uh, how are we to live? And here are four little outlines uh, taken from these uh, 11 verses, and I will give you the headline. Uh, we'll look at the, the verses, make one or two um, comments, and hopefully you'll get something of encouragement from it. Uh, so our attitude in um, these times, for the rest of our times, ought to be these. First of all, we ought to have a militant attitude towards sin, verses uh, 1 uh, to 3. A militant attitude towards sin. And Warren Wearsby has an interesting illustration. He talks about going into one of these posh restaurants with some of his friends where the mood lighting is very low, it's kind of dark. He says you almost need your torch to find your way to the table. And then you sit at the, at the table and maybe they light a candle, uh, gives you a little bit more light, and they give you the menu, and you've got to then order your... And so here he was in this restaurant. It was a very dark kind of place. And, uh, and after um, a moment or two or a minute or so, um, his eyes accommodate. It's amazing how your eyes can accommodate uh, to a dark situation, but it takes a little bit of time to, uh, to get your eyesight accommodated and your pupils open up. And, and, and so he was able to read the menu, and he made, um, he made some comment about this. And the friend who had invited him for this dinner said this. 
He said, it doesn't take us long to get accustomed to the darkness. It doesn't take us long to get accustomed to the darkness. And Wearsby said, there's a sermon in that sentence. Uh, and I think that's a very good illustration. We are living, friends, in an increasingly dark world. And I think a very simple mental exercise would quickly help you to understand it. Imagine, imagine if you could bring your granny back to life again. I presume, well, maybe the boys in the back maybe don't, but, but, but I, I presume for, for, for most of us, our grannies are long dead. I certain, I, my granny's dead a long time. Um, but suppose I could bring her back and I plonked her down in front of my TV. I should be amazed at the size of my TV, for one thing. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, and we flicked through some of the soap operas. And she listened to some of the news programs. And even, dear help us, uh, if she watched some of the programs that our children and our teenagers are watching, she would be horrified. <laughs> she, wouldn't, she wouldn't believe it. What? And they, and they have this stuff on the television. We have become accustomed to the darkness. And it is very easy for us just to go slowly, slowly, slowly along with the flow of the standards of the world around us. And Peter says, says no, we ought to have a militant attitude towards sin. Uh, the phrase in verse 1, arm yourselves, has this connotation of uh, soldiers getting ready to go to war and getting their swords sharpened and uh, their helmets on and whatever other equipment they might have had uh, in, those, in those days. And three things that um, would help us, I think, in that battle against sin is in verse 1, first of all, to think of what sin did to Jesus. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves in the same way. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Um, Jesus died in the flesh. His body was broken. His blood was shed. He gave, gave up his life in degradation and in agony to pay the price for our sins. And in our militant battle against sin, it will help us to recognize what Jesus has suffered. The second thing that will help us in verse 2 is to enjoy at the will of God. So as to live the rest of your time, the rest of your lives in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Recognizing that God always wants what's best for us. One of the things that irritates me enormously sometimes is when children and young people get the impression that God is a killjoy, that God is boring, that God just wants you to sit with a gray suit on and a long face and, uh, and never have any fun or enjoyment. Sometimes perhaps as Christians, maybe us older Christians, we give the kids maybe that impression sometimes. Uh, there are lots of things that are sinful things that, of course, we want to protect them from and, and encourage them to have nothing to do with it. But that doesn't mean that our Christian life and a life of discipleship and being a follower of Jesus is a dull or a boring life or that God doesn't want us to enjoy things. I mean, God, God invented stuff just for the fun of it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever wondered, you know, why did God make tropical fish? Um, I love to do a bit of snorkeling. Um, never had the opportunity to swim in the Red Sea. Maybe one day I'll, I'll get the chance, uh, or on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, but I've seen programs, I've seen it on TV, and, 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 and e e even just swimming around the coast here sometimes, you, you see a few colorful fish. Um, it's, it's beautiful, it's amazing. I mean, why did God make them so varied and so wonderful and so beautiful and so colorful? Well, just for the fun of it. Because <laughs> he enjoyed it. And there's so much that God wants us to enjoy. 
good things. So, a militant attitude towards sin, remember what it did to Christ. Enjoy God's purpose and God's will. And the third little injunction in, this, uh, in the next verse uh, is to remember what you were before you met Christ. Remember what a change there has been. Uh, the times that has passed suffice for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And then there's a list of dreadful things, sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and, and lawless idolatry. Now, perhaps some of you were converted when you were only six and you didn't actually participate in too many drunken orgies uh, when you were six. And God has spared you from many of those things. And if that's so, thank God for it. But for others, we have um, in the past done things that are shameful, uh, things that are dishonoring to God, uh, things that did us no good, and we don't want to recall it in one sense to um, sort of think, you know, well, we, 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 we've, we missed those things. We ought not to, but we ought to recognize the change that grace has brought in our life, the things that God has saved us from. And even if perhaps we didn't do those things, we've known others who did, and we often say the phrase, don't we, there but for the grace of God go I. Um, and when perhaps we're uh, inclined to uh, look down on some other dreadful sinner, some drunkard in the, in the gutter or something, um, mm -hmm. remember that but for God's grace, perhaps that might have been us, that might be us. So that's the first thing, a, a militant attitude towards sin, remembering what sin did to Christ and how he suffered for our sins, uh, enjoying what God's good will is for us to enjoy things, and remembering what you were. This, this, the, the second lesson, and again, these are Warren Weir's little headlines, and I like them, a militant attitude towards sin, and then secondly, a patient attitude towards the lost, a patient attitude towards uh, the lost, verses uh, 4, 5, and 6. Now, they flow on, but I, I think this division is, is, is helpful, and I, I like this. Um, okay, that's what you were in the past, and then with respect to these things, these people are surprised that you don't carry on uh, with them in the way that you did before, with um, the flood of debauchery and, and all these things, and, and they, they, they malign you, they slander you, um, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And then there's this complicated verse that I referenced briefly last week. I'll not get bogged down in it this week again. Uh, the gospel was preached to those who are dead. The NIV, I think, is probably a helpful translation. It adds the word now. Uh, so they were preached to them. The gospel was preached to them in the past. Uh, they, they, they are now dead. And in that sense, it's too late. This verse is not saying that you get a second chance. The Bible's clear. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment, Hebrews 9. Uh, so it's not saying that uh, there's a, another chance that there uh, doesn't seem to be that indication anywhere in, in, in Scripture. Um, but the gospel was preached to them. And, and we ought to have that attitude for those who are lost to want to share it with them so that they might be delivered from this life of sinfulness and debauchery and all these other dreadful things uh, to be brought into a new and living relationship with Christ, to have their sins forgiven, so they too might recognize how much it cost Christ to pay for their sins. So a militant attitude towards sin, a patient attitude, not condemning, uh, not condoning, but recognizing that only through grace and only through Christ can the lost be saved and encouraging them to find that way of salvation. And then the third thing, uh, verse 7, an expectant attitude towards the return of Christ, an expectant attitude towards the return of Christ. And verse 7 says, uh, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The end of things is at hand. Christ is coming back. And it's a theme in Peter and in 2 Peter as well. That uh, theme is particularly picked up when the question is raised, uh, well, um, things have been going on like this forever. Uh, you know, at the time, in the New Testament times, 
understandably, I think, many Christians believe that Christ would return in their lifetime. I mean, uh, some of them were perhaps alive when Christ was, was here and, and they saw him. They saw witnesses to the resurrection. Uh, and if not them, then perhaps their parents or maybe their grandparents, that uh, aforementioned granny, might have told them stories about uh, times when she um, heard Jesus. Um, and so that was kind of within living memory. And he had promised that he was coming again. And they thought, maybe it's this week, maybe today. And there was a heightened expectation that he would return. Now, of course, he didn't. Doesn't mean those promises weren't valid, true promises, and that it, that he that he uh, he won't be coming back. He will be coming back. It might be in our lifetime. It might be another thousand years, another two thousand years. I don't know. But the end of things is at hand, and therefore be uh, sober-minded, be level-headed. Don't be. Don't be fanciful about uh, these and fanatical about these things. And Wearsby has a wonderful a little story, illustration. He tells a story about how after a sermon on prophecy, a sermon he says he's filed and will never read again other than at times when he feels he might, maybe needs to be humbled a little bit uh, because he obviously had all of this worked out as a young man and he preached it with great vigor and, and, uh, and a friend said an interesting thing to him. Uh, the friend said, um, you must be on the planning committee for the return of Christ, <laughs> because he seemed to know the answers to everything and when this would happen and when that would happen. And Wearsby says he was uh, caught in his tracks a little bit and learned something valuable. And then his friends said something else which was even more helpful. And the friend quietly then said to him, you know, um, I have moved from the planning committee to the welcoming committee. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I don't know when Christ is coming back. I'm not on the planning committee. Uh, I struggle sometimes. Well, you, you've, you've, you've witnessed me struggling through the book of Revelation um, not long ago. Uh, there are lots of things I, I don't know. I do know that Christ is coming back. I do know that it might be tonight. Uh, I might not have to worry what to do with the youth fellowship tonight. Uh, the Lord might come before then. I might be in my grave hundreds of years before he does come. Uh, but he is coming. And I'm going to live in the light of that. But I'm going to be self-controlled and balanced and sensible, uh, level-headed with regard to these um, things. And then um, Peter says an interesting thing, uh, for the sake of your prayers, for the sake of your prayers, the end of all things is near, but be self-controlled. I guess that ties back to this attitude of um, militance against sin and so on, uh, and care for the for the lost as well. Being so reminded for the for the sake of your prayers, and is the theme that you often see in various places in the New Testament to watch and pray. I am watching for the Lord's coming. I love the story about an old lady that I read about years and years ago. And apparently her custom was when she got up in the morning, her alarm clock went off early and she, she jumped out of bed and she flung the curtains open. And her first words every morning was, Lord, perhaps you'll come today. She was living in the expectation that the Lord might come today. I dare say, I dare say that had some impact on how she lived the rest of the day. And maybe if you and I got up first thing in the morning and opened the curtains, and the first thought in our head was, the Lord might come back today. It might change our attitude to certain things. It might change some of the things we do or we don't do in any given day. Watch and pray. Uh, that attitude of expectation for Christ's coming will impact our prayer lives. And then uh, the final thing, uh, a fervent attitude towards the saints, verses um, 8 uh, to uh, 11. Um, the word uh, in the King James is fervent. The um, ESV is earnestly. The NIV um, says um, deeply. So it all amounts to the same thing. Um, but you'll see uh, Warren Wearsby likes the King James, so that's why he put the word fervent in his little title. A fervent attitude towards the saints. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly fervently, deeply. 
Since love, since love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, that's perhaps an allusion, if not a direct quotation, from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 10, 12 says that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. In other words, to be, to be forgiving. Uh, and we are to forgive one another. It's a challenge for us. It's a long sermon for perhaps a series of sermons for another occasion. But part of being um, loving towards the saints uh, is to be forgiving. Uh, to show hospitality is another thing that he specifically mentions. Show hospitality without grumbling. I don't know whether some of you uh, are very hospitable and you show hospitality and you're a good cook and uh, you're a, you, you have a spare room or two and, and you welcome guests and, uh, and you show hospitality. Um, but sometimes you find it a bit irksome and you do it with a little bit of grumbling. <laughs> so and so was and, and uh, uh, Well, I, I guess it's better to, um, to show the hospitality with a little grumble than not to show the hospitality. But the, the, the gold standard, uh, the thing that Peter is calling uh, us to as is, is, uh, um, believers who will show a fervent attitude uh, towards the saints is to show that hospitality without grumbling. And when the guest um, doesn't do the washing up and just ups and leaves or um, does some other thing that irritates us, uh, we still show them the hospitality. As each one uses gifts uh, in service for one another. Uh, one of the ways that we are to have this fervent, loving attitude towards one another is to use what we have. And we've all got different gifts. We've all got different resources. Some people might have lots of money, and they can be generous with that. Some people have a particular gift and burden for and ministry for prayer, uh, to pray for situations in the church. Um, some uh, have got lots of time on their hands. They're retired. And uh, mind you, I, a lot of people I know that are, are retired sometimes wonder how they ever had time to work. I always think that's a good thing. Uh, when I come across Christians who tell me uh, that uh, uh, they retired five years, ten years ago, whatever, and they, they wonder how on earth they ever had time to do any work. Uh, now, some of that may be time taken up with children or grandchildren or hobbies or other things. Um, but I'm glad to say that very often my experience is that amongst those Christian people, that time is taken up with Christian service, with things in the church, this church or another church or some other Christian organization. And so we are to use our gifts to serve one another uh, with the strength that God supplies. And I think that's an important thing to, to grasp hold of as well. Because some people are very capable, very able people, sharp minds, gifted with their hands, gifted in all kinds of ways. Of course, that ultimately is a, a blessing from God. But sometimes gifted people think that they're doing it. And, and, and sometimes they can become a little maybe condescending uh, when they do their thing. And, 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 uh, 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 but but, but Peter, Peter says, no, do it in the strength that God supplies. And, you know, I'm, I'm so encouraged sometimes when people say, oh, well, I don't think I could do that. I, c I couldn't do that. And then you coax them a little bit or some prompt them, and then they have a go. And don't behold, they do it very well. Uh, maybe do it in a different way from the way you would have thought of doing it. But nonetheless, uh, their service to someone else in the church is a tremendous blessing. It's because they have done it with the strength that God supplies. And listen to this, in order that, every, that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. Our Christian service isn't ultimately for our edification or for our glorification or for our benefit. It is for God's glory. And so in all these things, developing a militant attitude towards sin, a patient attitude towards the lost, an expectant attitude towards Christ's return, and a fervent attitude towards serving the saints. It is for Christ's glory, and to him belong glory and dominion forever. And as Peter says, amen. Amen.
And let's sing uh, this hymn of Mr. Wesley's, which I, uh, it struck me as a, a, a good hymn to, uh, to apply uh, this truth from uh, 1 Peter uh, 4. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and fit it for the sky for when the time has come for us to return. Let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.